Um, and we will get to that later on. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Bonnie, who will introduce our presenter. Okay, thanks, Debbie. Um, I'm Bonnie O'Leary, and I am the Outreach Manager for NBRC, and I'd like to welcome you all this evening to our program, Bridging the Gap Between the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Community and the Police. Our speaker is Master Police Officer Rihanna Jacobson. She is the Community Outreach Officer for the Fair Oak Station of the Fairfax County Police Department, where she has served for 20 years. And I'm delighted to introduce Rihanna to you this evening. She will give you an overview of the outreach program for her station, and then focus on concerns particular to deaf and hard of hearing residents. So Rihanna, thank you so much for your time tonight. Over to you. Thanks for the introduction. Hello, everybody. My name is Rihanna Jacobson. Um, as Bonnie told you, I've been an officer here at Fair Oaks for 20 years already. So um, I started out just as a regular patrol officer. I moved here from Buffalo, New York and wanted a fresh start. Wasn't really sure where Fairfax was on a map, but here I am 20 years later. So uh, 2004, I started the domestic violence detective program here in the county. I did that for about two years before my uniform and my marked police car were calling again and I went back to patrol. Um, taken two little breaks since then. Uh, I have two sons at home, um, but I'm currently doing outreach. So two years ago, they had asked if anybody would like to try doing an outreach position. I wasn't ex exactly sure what that even was, so I went to my commanders and asked, and um, they sort of laughed and said, are you interested? Um, I love trying new things, and I, I, I'm a talker. I'm sure you guys will know that by the end. So... I offered to take that spot and I started a couple days later. So two years later, I'm still waiting for them to give me an exact job description of what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but I do like that I don't have a specific description. That means that I can do anything as long as it is helping to bridge the gap between the police department and the community. So some of the things we've tried in the last couple of years, we figured we'd start with the young. So I was even going into the cafeteria at school, um, eating lunch with elementary school students for a couple of hours a day, a couple days a week. Uh, you know, it's not all about, hey, look at me, I'm the police. Some of it is just being a friendly face. I open yogurt. I help them get their string cheese open, and we just, uh, you know, learn that we're both human. So it's nice that they're not afraid, just in case something did happen. You know, I always get scared, what if? What if they were in a car accident and their parents were unable to talk? I wouldn't want a child to hide from me. I would hope that they would come forward and talk to me. Um, it's amazing how many hugs and high fives I get after just a few months of going into the school to be with the kids. Um, a couple other things they wanted me to try was to get more involved in community meetings. You know, the police department, we do a bunch of different things. We have officers on bicycles. We have officers on motorcycles. We have officers on boats. We have officers in helicopters. But if people don't know what we're doing and what we have available to help, they're not sure how to even reach out to us. So again, we're just trying to bridge the gap and make sure that everybody knows what resources are even available to them. Uh, another thing that was on my radar was um, helping out with some of our houses of worship. So we all watch the news. We see the very scary things 
that are happening in the news, it's frightening for everybody. So for them to have a person that they can call, I mean, everybody's seen a police officer working a car accident or, you know, that time that they might pull you over because you were going a little too fast is probably not a time that you feel comfortable asking a simple question like, how do I start neighborhood watch? Or, you know, what crime happens in my neighborhood? So outreach is here. We kind of just are the person who takes, I never know what I'm going to do on any given day. My job changes very much. Um, so I always giggle. We are in the yes business here. So we are here to help, however it may be. I've um, helped with bingo in a senior home before and had coffee with a cop even at a senior home just to try to bridge the gap there. We worry that sometimes um, our senior population um, can be victims of scams and they're embarrassed to tell their children or their family that they were a victim of a scam. Because of their age, they're afraid that some of their, you know, um, freedoms might be taken away from them for a silly mistake. And so we try to help in that aspect too. So you will see us all over the place. Each one of our district stations, there's actually eight in total, each station has both a crime prevention officer and a community outreach officer. So outreach is the newest position. Um, I was nervous that it was possible we wouldn't find money in the budgeting, but I think we've all realized that this position is necessary. A police officer in patrol is out trying to catch bad guys and keep people safe. They don't have time for even, you know, a nice presentation with community members where maybe we can both learn from each other. That's one of the things I'm truly here for today is to learn how we as the police department can do better also. So even with 20 years of experience, I have only had a few occasions where I have come in contact with somebody who was hard of hearing. One of them that pops into my head immediately was a 911 call that we had received. Dispatch wasn't getting an answer on the other end of the 911. They told me that they had reached out through TTY to see if maybe the person could have been hearing impaired and they didn't get a response. So they send me to just a 911 call, but I have no idea what I'm going to. So I get there and the person I'm supposed to meet when I knock on the door, she greets me immediately, but signals to let me know that she is hard of hearing. I don't know sign language. So I'm, I was a pretty new officer at the time, I will admit that much, but I almost felt a little bit of panic. What am I supposed to do with that call? Well. Thank goodness that woman who had called 911 had also done another signal to me. We all carry a notebook in our pocket. We all carry a pen in our pocket. So it was very easy for the two of us to communicate back and forth with writing each other notes. It took a little extra patience from both of us, but it was okay, and especially in that case, since truly she didn't have an emergency, a bird had fallen out of a nest and she had it in a shoebox. So thank goodness for that first time, neither of us was overwhelmed. It was not an emergency panicked situation. It was truly two people trying to work together to get animal control to help with that bird. So that does actually worry me though. What if? What if we have an emergency call? Someone calls 911. Now, we know as a police officer that when somebody speaks Spanish, it's very easy for us to get an interpreter on a telephone. We make a simple call from our cell phone and we talk back and forth to each other. But it's my understanding that we don't have a program 
just accessible to us as a regular patrol officer on the street that would even do sign language. Actually, when we have in progress busy calls, something like a, um, a violent crime against a person, we have police officers on staff, sworn officers, that also are interpreters of other languages. I'm sad to tell you, we don't have a police officer that is fluent in sign language, that you wouldn't have a person in uniform that can easily communicate. I do think this is a problem, and I unfortunately didn't really realize before this that we, we were behind. So um, for that case that I talked about, for the woman to motion with a notebook and a piece of paper to write back and forth, that worked great in that scenario. I would hope that if any of you, I know you see the blue lights behind you and you're scared. Everybody is. I'll be honest, I've been sleepy on my ride home before and I've seen the blue lights behind me and even my heart skips a beat just a little bit. So I understand that fear factor behind everything. However, for people who need um, assistance with that officers may be almost at a loss. We don't get specific training to people that are hard of hearing. So if you were so inclined, that same little motion, boy, that was all I needed and I felt instant relief knowing that I could easily communicate with somebody else. Now, of course, that was years ago before we all had a cell phone in our pocket. And so I assume there is probably an app that people use that is easier to use an interpreter. Or if you wanted to pick up your phone and use something like FaceTime or a similar app where you can see each other's face through your cell phone so that we would be able to communicate. We truly may lean on you. We don't have all of the languages available to us when we need them. So truly, we may rely on you to help with that. Any officer should be willing to listen, to help, and to be patient with you, even though this isn't our normal that we do every single day with communicating. So, is there anything else? <laughs> so I apologize, I am not a PowerPoint person. Some people love a PowerPoint presentation to learn all about what can be done. However, my job as outreach, I feel like that's a little on the impersonal side. Well, and I'm a little older and not awesome with computer programs, if I'm being honest, but I like being able to face-to-face -face learn from each other. So my experiences so far have been good. I'm fortunate that there hasn't been a serious uh, call that I have gone to where I needed immediate assistance and someone needed a sign language interpreter. Now I did have a community meeting that I had set up and someone had requested about a week before the meeting, hey, would you be able to have a sign language interpreter available? I can't tell you how many people I had to ask just to figure out where do I get that through the county. So that's probably a me issue. Um, when I found the right person, they easily answered, you know, contact this, this company or this person and we will get an interpreter here. It's not a problem but it was just something I hadn't thought of before. And I hadn't, so I apologize in advance, but it was just not something that I had come across yet. So after meeting Bonnie, I knew that we could probably both definitely learn from each other. And I know she's even offered some wonderful training for our police officers because we can always do better. Especially we see some scary stuff on the news of, you know, people who are walking with headphones in and don't respond to a police officer and bad things happen 
or people that are hearing impaired and they don't respond to an officer and an officer gets aggressive with them. I hope that stuff never does happen. I feel that we, we are better trained here in Fairfax than some of the stuff you see on the news. However, we can always do better. So um, I wanna make sure I can talk and talk. I think that's why they made me outreach, but I wanted to make sure that I gave plenty of time in case anybody did have any questions or to help me to understand how we can do better. Great, thank you so much, Rihanna letting us know you know what your experience has been with the community is great because you go so many different places um and you're bound to run into more and more folks um hearing loss of course is a, is something that can happen to anybody at any time um so whether you're dealing with kids or adults you know, from elementary school to senior citizens, a wide range of communication issues come up, maybe not even related to the language barrier. Mm -hmm. so. so true. <laughs> All right. So let me start out here real quick, taking a look at our chat box over here, because I do see a couple people are having questions. Okay, so one question that uh, comes up and this is probably a procedure question. Um, say someone in the evening, someone with a hearing loss is pulled over by an officer. And as the officer comes up to the car, he's got that flashlight out and shining it in the person's face. And now the person who is hard of hearing cannot see the officer's lips to understand what they're even asking. Um, so they're, you know, what can folks do in that kind of situation and is there any way to adjust the protocol for the officers? You know, I don't know that there is a simple solution to that. So unfortunately, the reason for that bright, bright spotlight that shines in the back of the car and the reason for that flashlight on the driver is because we're always concerned that the person could have a weapon. And we're concerned for our own safety, and that's the reason for that. But again, I do think that motioning somehow, you know, your hard of hearing or something to the, we get it. It's just like wearing a smile on your face. It's the universal, you know, we're okay, we're good. Even if we don't speak the same language, a simple smile changes everything. So... I think to motion that you're hard of hearing or try to tell them, you know, now an officer walks up. We, we actually here in Fairfax, because of the cameras inside of the car, we have a protocol that we actually have a script that we read off of. So there will be time for, hi, I'm Officer Jacobson with the Fairfax County Police. The reason I pulled you over tonight is because you know, you were speeding. And so you may have to wait a minute and you may miss all of that. However, to let them know you're having trouble hearing or you're having trouble hearing, even if it needs to be overly exaggerated, it really might have to happen. I have a question. Okay, Bonnie, hold on just one quick thing because I just wanted to let Rihanna know um, that the state of Virginia has actually uh, Virginia Department for Deaf and Hard of Hearing, uh, the DMV, and I am forgetting the third one, but it is the, the Upper Police Department's Association has actually put out a placard that folks can keep in their car. That bright orange placard um, <laughs> with I am deaf or hard of hearing, and then they can turn it over and it has things to help with communication. Um, so just to let you know that that's out there and I'll get one of those to you so you know about it. So that would be a relief to me if I saw that because at least 
that's an open line of communication right there, just to know. Similar, we've had people who have bumper stickers or whether, you know, I've seen ones that say I am hard of hearing or I am autistic or whatever it may be. Not everybody wants to put these things all over their car. So some sort of card or something to show. I mean, even if you kept it in the glove box with your registration or whatever would work, that would be an amazing fix right there that I didn't even realize existed. All right, uh, Bonnie, you had a question? Um, yes, I know that when the police pull you over, let's say you're speeding or there's something going on and they pull you over, you're supposed to put your hands on the steering wheel to show, I guess that you don't have a weapon or that, you know, whatever the reason is. But for those of us, if you're a person who is deaf, which is a very different, very different situation from being hard of hearing, I'm hard of hearing, but there are people who are profoundly deaf and they only communicate with sign language. So you've got this whole continuum there, but um, when I was pulled over, I wanted to reach for my little document that would tell the officer that I had a hearing loss and I didn't know what to do there because I didn't want him to think, I mean, me with a weapon, I mean, I don't really look likely, but just still, I was very nervous about it. So I didn't. And so when he, I put my window down and he started to talk to me, I said, I don't understand what you're saying because I have a hearing loss. And you know what? He, he just kept yapping. His response to me was like, and I thought, well, that, that's not really right because you've got to be able to communicate well. So, you know, I think that training, you know, would, would definitely help because he was very, very insensitive to it. And I couldn't understand half of what he said. So it took him twice as long to write me a ticket as he would have another time. But that reaching for what I need to show an officer, how do we handle that? So honestly, the reason for us putting our hands on that steering wheel or putting our hands up against the wheel is an officer saying is the hands are what hurt us because that's what would have a weapon in it or that's what would have, you know, that's what's going to hurt us right. when we're talking to somebody. So I don't know an easy solution for that other than if you had that big paper, maybe attaching it somehow to the visor in your car. I know that I can see as you're reaching, you know, or if you were deaf versus just hard of hearing. Maybe to try to sign on your steering wheel may be a way versus digging. So we worry about people putting their hands in their pockets to pull out their wallet. We worry because many people store a gun in the center console of their car or in their glove box. Right. And so that's the reason for that bright light. When we are watching your hand go into the car. Yeah. So and maybe a solution might be to attach it to your visor somehow would be my best suggestion because chances are your gun is not going to fit on top of your visor or stuck to the right. visor. But again, I'm sure people are concerned with putting big stickers all over their car. No one wants to be a victim because of, you know, whatever their disability or whatever else might right. be. So I would understand maybe putting it on the visor might be a good suggestion. Right. Yeah. Never really thought of it before though, Bonnie, getting those wheels turning there. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bonnie. Uh -huh. and, and that is a concern, um, particularly from a lot of the deaf community is they don't want to put something on the car that identifies that they might be an easier target uh, for someone trying to take advantage of them. I believe we had someone who wanted to ask a question on camera. Um, Brianna, did you want to go ahead and turn on your camera and ask your question? 
Hi. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you, Rihanna, for doing this, and thank you to all of you who helped organize this. I, you know, very interested to learn about what you guys are doing, what you've done in the past, and what you plan to do for the future. Um, I think someone also asked this question on the chat, but I was curious, I know you, uh, Rihanna, you said you were working with Bonnie on this, and maybe this is a better question for her to answer, but I'm curious to know what kind of training or programs you guys have for your officers, either stuff that you've done in the past or things that you're planning now, because I think it's important. I, I, I mean, I understand that you are aware of, you know, how it's hard for a deaf person who is pulled over by a cop to feel anxious or worried about moving their hands off the steering wheel. But I don't feel confident that a lot of other officers do. And I'm wondering, do you have some sort of basic sign, you know, program as well, because, you know, earlier you were talking about the story of going to the woman calling about the bird, right? And you said, as soon as the woman, you know, had the motion to write, you felt like it was so much easier to commute, or you felt instantly comfortable, right? But I think that you can't speak for the both of you, right? You probably felt very comfortable, but that, and of course, you know, that's not her way of communication for that woman. So, you know, sorry, this is a little bit of a long question, but I, you know, I'm curious because I think that, you know, there's a lot that is just simple explanation and training in addition to the science to show the deaf and hard of hearing community that their preferred way of communication is important and you guys need to be doing more to you know achieve that thank you you are absolutely right but that's with anything we can always do better and we can always get more training unfortunately i other than classes that pop up here and there for those that choose to take it i don't know that there is across the board training so i would love if bonnie would pop in because we were discussing trying to bring, now she does training with the fire department, is my understanding, but she's had some trouble getting in with the police department. And I want to make sure that I change that. Because again, you're so right. Even though it made me feel relief, I'm sure that the woman that I spoke with was frustrated, as she should be. We are to provide service to people, protect and serve, and I don't know that she was best served with my little notebook and our handwriting back and forth to each other. So is Bonnie available to pop in, maybe give a quick overview of her training that she does? Let's see if she's there. Okay. Um, actually, we do hope to have a kind of some cross training um, with the police as well as other emergency services um, in the future. So we've got our fingers crossed on that. And we do talk about, you know, how do we how do we identify that? What the person's communication needs are? What kind of devices or uh, workarounds you could use? For communicating with folks. Um, so that is something that we're going to be working on. There was one thing here real quick. Um, you had mentioned, someone in the chat had a suggestion. You mentioned about the officer has a script that they have to follow. And perhaps it would be nice if the officers could have a copy of that when they go up to the car for folks to read if they have a hearing loss. Um, so that way they're not struggling so hard when they're already stressed out. There's a cop in my window. Um, <laughs> and, and so that might be a nice uh, workaround if that's possible to work into their protocols. And that is a fabulous idea right there. Even something that is pocket size, that like a business card that we could carry right in our pocket. I get it. You may go your entire career and never need it. But if you even use it one time, it was worth carrying it around in your pocket. 
it makes a big difference. But stuff again that we, unfortunately, I mean, not to be insensitive, but we just, if no one tells us that it's an issue, we just keep going about business as usual. And unfortunately, before we had community outreach, there was no person to try to have these conversations in the middle to even find out how we can do better. We just keep going and sometimes, unfortunately, until there's a problem and then we work on doing better. But it'd be great if we could do better before there's a problem this time. Right, absolutely. All right. Um, someone was wondering what kind of training um, the officers have uh, in terms of working with folks with disabilities, you know, um, because not every disability is a visible disability. Yeah. For some folks, you can see the wheelchair or the crutches. For a lot of people, the disabilities such as deafness, hearing loss, autism, a lot of these are not visible. Um, and so they were wondering if officers are, are get training on this kind of interaction. So with some of it, we do. One of our big hot topics that has been for the last couple of years is for people to be able to call in and request a CIT officer. That's Crisis Intervention Trained Officer. And what that means is the officer has specialized training in things like autism or Alzheimer's and dementia or other special needs. However, I took the original class, so which was 10 years ago at this point, and then I wasn't eligible for the new class because I had already taken the previous class. Our chief's goal was to get every single officer trained. Now, I don't know in the new class if it even touches on people who are deaf or hard of hearing. You know, we make special arrangements and have to have special vehicles. If we make an arrest and a person is, for example, in a wheelchair, they can't ride in our police car and we fold up their wheelchair. It doesn't work that way. We actually have a special transport vehicle for them. But most of the time, it doesn't get used enough, thank goodness, of course, but it doesn't get used enough that it sits for extended periods of time. Sometimes the battery doesn't even start when we need it finally for whatever reason. So as much as we try to fix some of these problems, <laughs> we can always do better. Exactly. Okay, someone in the chat is asking, Suppose I'm being pulled over, driving at night, being pulled over, but you're kind of in the middle of nowhere. You don't feel safe pulling over there. But just a little ways down the way is, say, a gas station or a more public area. How do you, how do you signal to the officer that, yes, I see you, but I don't feel safe to park here. Can we get down to the lights? So for me... If someone would hit their four-way flashers to give all the warnings that they see me, they recognize I am behind them. Now, if you just continue to drive, I don't know if you're just slowly driving away and I'm going to have to chase you. Those four-way flashers do help immensely. Again, just so we're communicating without even talking to each other. Great. Thank you. Another person had a concern. Um, they went into uh, their local police station last year with a question, but the only way to communicate with the officer was with this telephone. And there's a big plate of glass. And that telephone had a really bad connection, for some, particularly for someone with a hearing loss. Um, and the person you know, couldn't come out from behind the glass to try to communicate. What is a good way to, to get around that? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> that is a really good question because we can't hear through that glass at all. That is ballistic glass. It is quite thick, so we can't hear through it, and that's why we use the telephone. Now, honestly, I think that that person could have easily 
come around and come out to speak to the person in the lobby so that we could have handled that better. Again, I, I don't understand why there is such a lack of patience and lack of kindness, truly, sometimes, that we can all do better. That should, I feel, that that should not have happened. But I don't know if there's a better way to communicate unless you want to text on your cell phone and stick it up against that window so that we could read it might be one solution. But again, that's not, that's not perfect either. Yeah. Yeah. So even, even just this kind of conversation brings up things that were, oh, I never thought about that kind of barrier to the communication. Um, it is definitely, as someone mentioned, it definitely would help if each station had at least one or two people who were interested in learning sign language, um, you know, and kind of exploring these communications to improve, um, improve communication with the community. <clears throat> Let me see here. Yeah, as, as they said, someone, each, each station should have someone who's an expert in this, which would really be helpful. It would be helpful. And previously, we would actually ask on applications for new hire police officers, do you speak any other language? Or, you know, are you sign language certified or anything like that? Unfortunately, we just don't have anybody who is. So which I find shocking. It's my understanding there's around 1,500 of us. How does nobody know sign language or at least be willing to share that with the people in the community? Another question. Um, how many CIT officers are currently available in Fairfax Police Department? Do you know? So the chief's goal was to get 100% compliance with CIT. However, with it being a long, it's either 40 hours or 80 hours. So to put each officer through that, and especially now with COVID where nobody can even be together, um, it takes a while to get people through that training. Um, now mine, because I took the original class 10 years ago, I'm considered not CIT certified, even though I did take a class. So I think right now we have maybe a third to a half of all officers are trained, but that training comes out on a regular basis because it's something we really do need to recognize, you know, everybody communicates differently and we need to recognize that. Great. Someone suggested a device that might be helpful to the police stations. It's called an Ubi Duo. And that is, it's basically two keyboards with a little screen that communicate with each other so that the, the person who's deaf or hard of hearing can type and then the officer can type back. And so that might be something that's helpful for the stations to keep in their, um, in their little communication kit Let me see here. Are there opportunities uh, for, I mean, obviously you go out to community meetings, but are there also opportunities for the community to go to the police department meetings and get to know their local officers? So every one of our district stations has what's called a CAC. It's a Citizens Advisory Committee. I know they're talking about changing that name because for some reason, it's, it, it doesn't attract people to the police department. But it is truly once a month meetings where we have a guest speaker of your choice. So you can learn a little bit about what some of our specialty units do here and we just communicate with each other. Questions back and forth. And it can even be as simple as, hey, I read on the internet, or I read on Facebook, or on Nextdoor, 
that vehicles are being broken into. What happened with those vehicles or something to that effect? It doesn't need to be something huge. We just communicate back and forth with each other. So each station has them. I wish I could give you a specific day or a specific time, but we all do them at a different time so that we can share guest speakers sometimes also. But your district station has a CAC and we're always trying to get more numbers and more people to come in. So part of the CAC is monthly meetings so that we can talk to you about what we do and you can talk to us about what you need. But honestly, every other month or so, we even do something as simple as a soup social at the station. So the police officers that are working that day can come in have a bowl of soup and warm up in the middle of the winter. Not now when it's over 100 degrees, but in the winter, for example, a bowl of soup, we chat, we break bread, and you start to recognize officers. So especially the ones who might be patrolling right in your own backyard. Excellent. Someone asked if there is a registry or some way to let officers know when there is, say, a deaf child in the house or someone with autism in the house, and now you've gotten a 911 call, you're on your way to that location, is there a way to, to let the officers know that information beforehand? There sure is. So unfortunately, our dispatch system is an antique at this stage of the game, but we do have access to it where I can put information in or any police officer for that fact, can put information into the system. So when we're dispatched to a call, the screen tells you the address where you're going to, what the person needs, and you know there's maps and different things in case you need it for the area. But there's actually buttons across the top that light up. One of them says look LOI for location of interest. And so location of interest would tell us even something as simple as, you know, um, eight-year-old male child in home is deaf. I don't want to put a whole lot of information in there. I don't want your name and your birthday and your, I keep it very basic, but enough to know. And that's actually something I started more, I put together an autism fair at our headquarters building uh, last year, and it was very successful but to reach out to parents of autistic children, especially when they, they might be nonverbal, they may make different noises. They may not respond the same way as other children do, whether it's for police or something else. And as I explained to parents, I don't need to know everything, but even something like if I get sent to a domestic violence call because somebody hears loud banging inside and the noises of somebody who sounds like they're screaming. Well, if you have an autistic child in your home, that might explain what's happening. Or if you were to call 911, but you can't talk because you're having a medical emergency, I would like to know that you have a nonverbal five-year-old in the house. Because if you're not able to tell me or you are having a heart attack and you're not even conscious when I get there, I would like to know that I should probably take a glance around just to make sure that there's not a nonverbal five-year-old hiding in a closet because they're scared from the commotion that's happening outside of their house. Mm -hmm. So yes, we do have it, location of interest. We can put it in and we can take it out. So and it's available at every one of the district stations. So that's something that folks, if they wanted to make sure that the police had that information, they could contact their local district station to provide that. Or the fire department can put it in also. We share our dispatch system. So if I put it in, the fireman can see it. If the fireman put it in, I can see it. So it's perfect. Excellent. Um, as many folks know, but maybe some don't, Fairfax County now has text 911 available. And so is that something that you're seeing used more often, contacting 911? 
So I don't actually have an answer to that because I don't work at the dispatch center. Mm -hmm. They would know better than I would. And we, you know, one of the things we promote, call if you can, text if you can't. So, and sometimes that means because, you know, you're scared and you're hiding and you're trying to be quiet. And so you're texting instead, or it could simply be, that's your best way to communicate with us. And that's totally okay too. Excellent. All right. One of our folks in the chat um, actually mentioned a gentleman named Kevin Gant, mm -hmm. um, who is Fairfax County police officer. Apparently he does know some sign. So I think he is with our sheriff's department, if ah. I'm not mistaken. So brown uniform, but very similar. We are actually different departments. Um, I think they use him quite a bit over at our jail and our courthouse. But yes, last I knew, he was one of the people I reached out to immediately when I needed a sign language interpreter for my community meeting. He's the guy I called. <laughs> it's y'all. Yeah. All right. I'm just checking through the chat and make sure that I haven't missed anything here. Okay, one question that did come up um, is question to the officers, how are they trained to respond if somebody doesn't respond to verbal commands? Say you do encounter someone who's deaf or autistic who cannot hear or respond properly to those commands. Obviously the officers have to make sure that everybody stays safe. Um, but what are they trained to do in those kinds of situations? So um, that's part of that CIT training or those of us who went to special autism classes also, which is something that I know I um, volunteered to do for my station and bring that training back to my station um, to train all of the officers. But, um, you know, even just the key to all of that, patience, patience, patience. You know, we just, we need to take a step back now you know, once upon a time as a police department, we were trained, you know, we ask you to do something, we tell you to do something, and then we make you do it. Well, that is not okay. We, that was definitely old school thinking, and it is not okay. We learned that there's so many different people and so many different ways and disabilities that we need to be sensitive to that. So truly, just patience, maybe giving some distance. I know, you know, one of the things that a lot of officers really kind of were taken aback by with the autism training is when dealing with a child who is autistic, it's almost backwards from everything we normally do. Usually, you know, if somebody was going to walk away from us, we'd get closer or if they're not listening, we talk louder. That does not work with somebody who's autistic. And truly, I mean, I feel like any of us who have kids, we definitely know the difference between somebody who is intentionally ignoring you like they are 13 years old versus they really just, they can't hear you. Whether it's because they have headphones in which happens often. You think about these tiny little earbuds that people use that sometimes, yeah, <laughs> they just, <laughs> they don't hear you at all with those little headphones in. So whether it's because they're deaf, hard of hearing, have headphones in, we need to take it all into consideration. So I, police work is not easy. It's really not. It is a new challenge every single day. That's why a lot of us love it. It's different every single day and we learn every single day. So patience really is what we need to work with. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Are there any more questions from folks? 
or do you have experiences that you might want to share? We're good. Okay. You know, if you have an experience you want to share that you want to sign your own experience, we can turn on the camera. Or if when we're finished, if you think of something afterwards, please feel free to reach out to me. I, I don't mind one bit. I enjoyed this more than you know, um, just learning back and forth. You guys have my brain going about 100 miles an hour right now. Okay, let's see. I think we might have one person. Oops. Yeah, okay. Let's see if we can get Nancy's camera up here. Hold on. And we will have your information, right, Rihanna? If folks do think of something later that they want to reach out to you, um, we, we will have your contact information as well. And I just put my email address in the chat just in case they wanted it ahead of time. So I don't forget. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. All right. We have Nancy coming up on the screen here. Um, and she has something that she wants to say. Hello. I don't know if the interpreter can see me, if the lighting's okay, or the placement of the light is off, but I live in a small town in Herndon. And I really, you know, it's a, it's a small town, I would say, you know, how many stations did you say you had? Eight. Oh, only eight? <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, it should be easy for us to find one. It, would it be easier for us to find one in our area? I mean, what about volunteers of individuals that would come to volunteer during coffee breaks when they have nothing to do or sitting around or different coffee chats, somebody to volunteer to teach sign language? That might be a great option. Oh, well, I'm available, <laughs> you know? Oh, right now it's up for grabs, so take it while you can. I appreciate the offer, and I think we do need to get started on this. Now, please understand, because of the pandemic, that I actually worked out in patrol in a police car for the last four months. There was no outreach. There was no officers on bicycles. All of that was out in patrol. So slow start getting back, but we're, we could use your help. If it would be helpful if the police would also wear clearly f clear face shields when out on patrol and when they're talking to individuals who might need to rely on lip reading and NVRC has has a lot of them um, to they have clear face shields it's not just for lip reading but for facial expressions as well so of course that's ever changing too we had face clear face shields that were donated here to our station and they had to be checked by the safety officer. I haven't seen them in months. I don't even know where they went to. They decided that our best um, resource was for everybody to have matching dark blue masks. So I will definitely suggest the clear face shields or the masks where it's clear. It would be a great idea. I mean, just have it on hand, like if they come encounter with someone who might need that, they're able to put it on and have the clear facial expressions and lip reading available. Very important. Thank you. 
Thank you Thank so you. much, Nancy. All right, folks, we're coming to the end. We want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Rihanna, again, for your time. If you all do think of other questions or concerns that you have, um, get in touch with MVRC. We can put you in touch with Rihanna. She put her email address in the chat box, and we'll, we can send that out later as well. So thank you, everybody. Uh, Bonnie, did you have any last minute things you needed to add? Um, no, I'm good. I think we pretty much covered as much as we can in that one hour. Great. And I thank Rihanna for coming. It was a good program. And thank, thank her also for speaking so very clearly. That was a treat. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. And as we mentioned before, we did record this. Um, so if you forget things that were mentioned, get in touch with us. We can let you know. Okay. All right. Thank you all so much. Have a good night. Stay safe. Remember your masks. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Rihanna. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.